I'd also like to introduce now the Science Culture Talk by Ruchi Parekh, who received her bachelor's degree at Ohio Wesleyan University, or PhD at Penn State. She did her postdoc at George Mason University and also there became involved in a pro as project manager of Neuromorph, an online database for neuronal reconstructions of light microscopy data. She joined Janile in 2016, tasked with assembly and leading the Connectome annotation team. And in her talk, she'll tell us about how she recruited, trained, and built a collaborative culture of mostly recent college um, graduates to help uh, in the effort to uh, annotate all of the neuronal connections in the fly brain. Hello world, my name is Ruchi Farik and I manage the Connectome Annotation team at Janelia. My talk today is entitled The Cat Culture and what I'm going to do in this talk today is address two questions. First, what is the cat? And two, what is the cat culture? To talk about the cat, I have to talk about the Connectome. So Jerry introduced that there are several steps involved in getting to a Connectome, starting from prepping the tissue for EM imaging, for registering and aligning those, issue, uh, those um, uh, images, segmenting that image using automated um, uh, algorithms by Google where you get entire neural morphologies, automated ways of predicting synapses on that EM image, and then a human proofreading effort that informs and improves the automated processes to create a connectome in the end which is accurate for analysis. At Janelia in 2016, the Fly TEM project released the female adult fly brain volume. And then in 2018, followed by um, the Hemi Brain, which uh, Jerry talked about in his, um, in his talk, which was released by the Fly EM project. Now, even though both of these are EM data sets, they're inherently different from each other. The FAFB data set in 2016 was essentially a stack of 2D images, whereas the Hemi Brain, yes, it included the EM images, but also had neural morphologies that were automatically segmented and it included synapses. So scientists at Janelia wanted to get into these data sets to extract meaningful biological information. But in order to do so, they needed trained experts who knew how to navigate these data sets. The ethos at Janelia is small labs, big science. What this means is for small labs to be able to do big science, they tap into shared resources available to them at Genelia and then and do incredible science and discovery. And so the Connectome Annotation team was built as one such shared resource that scientists could, could use to navigate both of these EM data sets. So to build this team, I reviewed resumes um, from 500 applications over three, over three years. In reviewing these resumes, I was looking for a minimum of bachelor's degree, some science background, some lab experience, but EM experience was not necessary. Out of these 500 applicants, I conducted phone interviews with 350 people. I kept these phone interviews pretty short. I asked all individuals what, was their, what were their long-term career plans. I asked them what they understood this, what this position was about. And I asked them how they thought this position would help them in their long-term career goals and if they had any questions for me. From these 350 applicants, I selected 150 to come on campus for in-person interviews. We conducted these in-person interviews as sort of like a speed dating event. We had four to six candidates in a given day that were interviewed by six different interviewers. And we also had a tracing session because I wanted to understand if they could follow basic instructions and I wanted to see their ability to navigate novel environments. But I think most importantly for me, from these conversations, I wanted to understand if these individuals had a fire in their belly, what motivated them, what were they driven by, so that I could assess their future potential within the team from this conversation. After these in-person interviews, we selected 68 of these individuals to be hired as trainees. And after an extensive training protocol and pipeline that was built within the team, we selected 58 of these people to become annotators in the team. Now, this is simply a summary of all of the training and hiring that we did over a period of three years. So once we had a team of annotators together, the first project we started working with in 2016 was the FAFB dataset. Tracing in the FAFB was a manual effort. This required the individual tracers to, tra to scroll through sections and sections and sections of EM data 
to trace an individual neuron. And as they scroll through these sections, they would drop breadcrumbs or nodes, which the software would connect and create a stick figure or a skeleton of a neuron. But because this was incredibly time consuming, the collection of neurons that you see in this video, there are 30 or 40 of them, we had to trace all of these to find one or two that we were actually interested in. Now doing this work, um, members of CAT traced individual neurons for circuits that were of interest for various labs at Genoia. So I've color coded the labs over here with the individual neurons that we traced for them in this image below. So as you can see, it took 26 tracers, four years to trace approximately 7,500 neurons. So now the other data set that we worked in was the hemibrain data set. And here it's, the, the workflow was incredibly different because instead of going after individual circuits for individual labs at Genelia, we were working on an entire connectome of the fly brain. We were working on an entire data set. And so, for example, one example of a workflow in, in this case is cleaving. So we use a software called New3. And in this instance, you're seeing a proofreader is trying to make a decision. These overlapping branches that you see in front of you, whether they belong to a single neuron or they belong to two separate neurons. And so in this workflow, the proofreader is going to look at the entire morphology that's in front of, in front of them to make an assessment and decide whether two neurons are crossing over each other or not. And in this particular instance, they do decide there are two neurons and we'll color them, color one of them red, and we'll color the other one blue. Now the proofreader is only making that decision in this software at this time, but the actual splitting or cleaving of this neuron will happen behind the scenes algorithmically. But the proofreader makes this call and then moves on to the next assignment. So doing this work for the hemibrain, which was a connectome, it took 50 proofreaders two years to review 25,000 neurons. And in addition with these 25,000 neurons, there were 20 million synapses that connected these neurons to each other. So the growth of this team reflected the requirements um, uh, for the team over the years. So we did, a, there was a ramp up to build this team of 50 people specifically for the Hemi brain. But during the same time, the tools and softwares were being developed, they got faster and better um, so that the proofreading didn't take as much effort or time. And so we continue doing connectome proofreading for future data sets, but we don't need as many people uh, because of the improved tools and technology. So now to the second question, what is a cat culture? To tell you about the cat culture, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. After completing high school in Bombay, India, I moved to the American Midwest to start my undergraduate career at a small liberal arts school in Delaware, Ohio, called Ohio Wesleyan University. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life when I first came to the US. I knew only two things. One, that I wanted an education, I wanted to learn. And two, going back was not an option. During my junior year at Ohio Wesleyan, I declared psychology as my major, still not knowing what I'm going to do with it in my life. And in a seminar series, much like the one that we're in right now, a scientist came and sort of explained um, the, the data that he was working with that included neurons like these. That was, so here's an example of the neuron from the rat neocortex that had been stained with Golgi. And he explained that the dendrites on these neurons had these structures called dendritic spines, which were dynamic and changed based on the experience that the, the rat had gone through. And I remember being completely in awe of this talk because one of the things I struggled with the most in, in with my classes like genetics or microbiology was that I couldn't I couldn't see the thing I had to actually study whereas here I could see this neuron I could see its structure it meant something and it was beautiful to look at and so at the end of his talk I went and convinced somehow Dr. Mervis to let me volunteer in his lab so during my junior year, I learned how to stain tissue using the Golgi stain. I learned how to trace those same Golgi stained neurons using camera lucida. Now this is literally tracing, using pencil on paper to trace neurons. And I, little, I learned a little bit about data management, data analysis as well. After all of this, still not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, I went to Penn State to do my PhD in neuroscience, and then a postdoc at the Krasnow Institute at George Mason. At 
at George Mason at Krasnow, I was essentially, I was managing a project called neuromorpho.org. And as part of our academic work, one of the things we had to do was to go into classrooms and tell undergraduate students what we did in our labs on a daily basis. So I went into one such talk and explained that I mined publications to extract publications that had neuron reconstructions in them. I contacted those authors and encouraged them to share and contribute the data with the rest of the community. If they agreed to do so, then they sent the data to us. I processed them, standardized them, and made them available on the website so that others in the community could download this data and use it freely for their own scientific interests. Now, at the end of one such talk, um, a student came up to me and said that she'd like to volunteer in this project. And I was a little bit confused uh, because I thought I had just finished explaining what was an incredibly boring, tedious, monotonous process of the project. But she very matter-of-factly said that she was going to medical school and she wanted to build a resume with a research experiences that was diverse and she hadn't seen anything like this before. And so she, so she wanted to add this to make for a strong application to medical school. It seemed like a reasonable argument. And so I started with that one volunteer in, in the project. That's her under the red arrow over there. And so over the next few semesters, the word, of, the word spread and I had more undergraduate students signing up to volunteer with me on the project. And for the entire time that I man managed this project, I had at least 20 undergraduate students with me at any given time working on this project. So when I was hired at Janile to work with these two EM data sets, I knew right away the, the, the potential and learning that existed for undergraduate students or people who were just starting out their careers, not knowing what they wanted to do with their lives. And so CAT traces and proofreads data, but because I hired with the future potential in mind, when opportunities came up that required more from my team, such as building a progress dashboards for marking progress on the work that we were doing in the Hemi brain, or assisting the scientists at Jamila in identifying and grouping and matching neurons, or making sense of the connectome that we were proofreading by exploring visuals for data for, um, for representing connectomes, or testing the database that held the connectome itself or building visuals so that we could navigate the database in a more meaningful way, or building training manuals or tutorials so others could, man to, could navigate this database to understand it a little bit further. When these opportunities came up, I simply matched them with the potential that I knew existed in my team. And I stepped back and watched the magic unfold. So the culture of this team is to do the work that we've been hired to do. But because we get this incredible privilege and opportunity to work in this space where there are so many opportunities to learn, to develop new skills, to make a contribution to scientific discovery, and hopefully along the way you'll discover something about yourself and then move on to the next chapter. That is what the CAT is about. I told you early on that there were 58 annotators that I hired on this team. Out of these 58 annotators, several have moved on to the next chapter in their lives to the next jobs, to graduate school, to medical school. And so as I myself was going through my graduate career and my postdoctoral career, I used to go to an every, every SFN conference, Society for Neuroscience conference, and I would go and look up Dr. Mervis at the exhibitor booth just to say hi and to catch him up on the work that I had been doing in my career. And each, each year that I went back, he had a new group of undergraduate students that he would introduce me to and say, here is this Indian girl who traced neurons listening to rap and hip hop. And so as I close out my talk right now, Dr. Mervis, if you're listening in from Columbus, Ohio, I wanna say thank you for giving this 20 year old a chance to start her career in neuroscience in your lab. I also wanna thank Jerry Rubin. I know I speak on behalf of my entire team and myself when I say that it has been an incredible privilege to be part of this Connect Home journey with you. And to read George, without whose mentorship, neither Kat nor I would have been successful at Janelia. Reed, I, I thank you for showing me the way when I needed it, but most importantly, for stepping back when I needed to find my way myself. And finally, to this team. This is all, th this is all of the annotators on the team, past and present. This is the Kat, this is the culture, and neither would have been possible without each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. That was a great talk. 
Um, we definitely have a lot of questions. And again, I'm just going to read a few in the interest of time. Um, the first is um, from Ramunajan Hage. Are there aspects of the workflow that could possibly be crowdsourced um, more broadly across a web interface? Yes, certainly. Um, not that we are set up to do that, but I know of several other um, projects um, that do use crowdsourcing to um, trace neurons. Um, yes, it does exist, sure. Excellent. And um, Dave Miklos um, has a question um, about how much time per week did each annotator spend on the Hemibrain project? And is this um, always a full-time job or, or were there some part-time um, positions as well? Yes, so the members of my team were hired as full-time employees. So they are working on the Connectome eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Excellent. Um, can you clarify, I know you mentioned this at the beginning, um, um, sort of the backgrounds of the annotators that you hired, but um, can you remind us, was it, um, what kind of degree was necessary or background was necessary? Um, if, for example, is a college degree um, required to, to join the annotator team? Yeah, so I, um, I decided to uh, have at least a minimum of a bachelor's degree when I was reviewing the resumes. Early on, um, one, of, one of the reasons for doing that was because I needed people to have some minimal science background because we weren't really set up to teach people um, sort of the basics of neuroscience. I needed them to have some information and some lab experience. So a bachelor's degree was um, definitely required. And even if um, they didn't have a biology or neuroscience background, um, some science background would have, um, was, was helpful um, to help them succeed in this position, yeah. Sure, great. One last question here from Glenn Mason. Um, he's curious, where did you advertise these CAT positions um, since they don't fit neatly into um, a typical science position or a typical operational position or, you know, it's not uh, specific to postdocs or technicians, um, where and how do you advertise? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so we did, through working with the HR rep that we had at Genelia, we posted the regular sort of um, online job sites, but because I knew of the potential that existed in the undergraduate population, I also, we also specifically targeted the local universities in the, universities in the Washington DC metro area. And I had some contacts in the university that I had been at. So we essentially um, sent this posting out to the um, uh, um, program mailing lists um, such as psychology, biopsychology, neuroscience. So we definitely targeted individual colleges in this area um, through their career fairs to recruit people. Excellent. Thanks, Rishi. I think um, that's all the time we have for Q&A today. Um, I just want to end with um, by briefly um, um, thanking the speakers. I would love to be able to share my screen here. Um, I want to thank um, both Jerry and Rushi today for giving um, fabulous talks. I know that we did not have um, all the time that we wanted for questions, um, but um, I promise that in the coming weeks, um, it will be um, much more streamlined so that um, we can allow more questions and more questions asked by the audience members. Um, um, speaking of the audience, I want to thank the audience as well. I want to um, um, call out that we had um, over 800 viewers um, during the seminar and so I'm really we are all really pleased with that number um, if you enjoyed it please spread the word um, we're happy to have anybody join um, and uh, don't forget to please head over to our slack channel after um, the close of the seminar um, any questions that were not answered today um, our, the speakers have promised me that they will join and answer your questions um, I have put the link in the chat box and I will do it again um, and last but not least, I want to, of course, um, highlight next week's speakers from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Those are Michaela Egeblad and David Miklos. So please be sure to join us um, next week and head over to um, um, Slack for continued and ongoing exchange. Thanks, everyone.